Assalamu alaikum everyone. I am Dr. Alavaj and I work in Nidhi Umar Alis Demir University, a Department of Agricultural Genetic Engineering, Faculty of Agriculture Sciences and Technologies. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Azhar Rasul for inviting me to uh, for the talk in third international conference on applied zoology. Actually, I, I can, you can say that I'm not a zoologist. Uh, basically, uh, my training is in plant breeding. Then I graduated in plant biology, molecular biology, broadly, generally speaking. But because of my research interest and because of the application of my technology in some part of entomology, uh, you can say that still, you can, uh, it could be included in applied zoology. So thank you, Dr. Azar, once again. Today, I will talk about uh, application of DSRNA technology against insect pest. We have started, we started two projects back in 2015 and 16, where we tried to use this technology to control the insect pest. And basically because we are working uh, in an area where the potato is abundantly grown, and mainly our research focus was on uh, Colorado potato beetle, but I would go through the insect pest part generally, and I will try to emphasize the need of this technology, and then to some of our research results, which have already been published. So whenever we talk about the insects, insects are really notorious. Uh, you know, being a researcher in the field of agriculture, we have a lot of challenges. By the end of 2050, we will have more than 9 billion populations, and we will need to grow 100% more food. And another challenge we have today is about the climate change. And whenever you think about from entomology point of view, so you came to know that, you come to know that the more cl this the climate change means more insect pests and hence less food for the human beings. So according to one estimate, the grain losses from the wheat, corn, and rice will increase by 10 to 25 percent by every extra degree Celsius of the warming. This was a research work, uh, work conducted by different researchers. And, you know, uh, since actually since the dawn of agriculture, we are nourishing these insect pests to the crops whenever we raise them. And their mandibles really are, they consume plant parts and hence, you know, the 10 to 20 percent and in, in sometimes in, more, in some crops to 40 percent loss, yield losses have been reported by these insect pests. But when we see all this, uh, in the in 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 the aspect of this climate change, this is really more worrisome because, uh, you know, to, according to estimate, if uh, scientists believe that there will be the two degree uh, Celsius change, so if imagine if there is two degree Celsius exchange, then the scientists believe that these insect pests will deprive us of further 19 million metric tons of wheat and 14 million tons of rice and hence maize. So, so in the point I wanna make that insect pests are really, really threat to our crops at the moment. So what are the challenge, uh, what are the, to, to combat the insect pest challenge, the current techniques we know are the, use of extensive application of chemical insecticides. And this is what being practiced all over the world. But what we see then, the extensive application of these insecticides has, has resulted in the development of resistance in these, in, in these insect pests against insecticides. And this is one of the, although the data is a bit uh, old, but that's true, you can see that. And the, how the different insect pests, Bermisia terbaceae, aphis, gossipi, and chloridopidate beetles, they have got resistance against number of new 
insecticide, almost to every group of insecticides, and also the new chemistry insecticide. So uh, another another widely adopted strategy against the insect pest is the use of transgenic crops. And you know, since 1996 uh, up to 2018, 196 million hectares of transgenic crops are being grown worldwide. And Pakistan is also one of them where we, we are growing cotton. And the, the strategy to control these insect pests, uh, again, again, especially to this Colorado potato beetle, uh, was the transgenic potatoes that were introduced shortly in 1995-1996 in the market, and because of some unavoidable factors, that product was withdrawn from the market. So the point I want to make here, that the different strategies are adopted to control these insect pests, transgenic technologies and the chemical, and uh, the application of the chemical insecticides are the more widely adopted at the moment. But what we see, if we look at the transgenic crops, I told you already the insect pests have developed resistance against the chemical insecticides. Yes, but if you look at the, uh, the transgenic technology, again, the news is not good. For example, this, this is a paper from the Tabashner group in 2030. And here you can see, if I can show you with this, yeah. Here you can see that the hectare of the transgenic crop is increasing. And at the meantime, what we see that almost five resistance species of insects have been reported that developed resistance against these transgenic crops, especially BT, the BT crops. The same, same group published in 2018 in Nature Biotechnology. And again, you can see that the hectare of transgenic crops has increased to 100 millions of hectares. But at the same time, the number of the insects that are developing resistance against these BT crops has gone to 16. And uh, this, is the, this is the area where the practical warnings, practical resistance, and early warnings have been reported. So, so this is a time a kind of alarming situation for all the researchers related uh, in the area of plant protection. So what the different researchers report different reasons how we can delay this resistance development in insect pest. Various and delaying strategies have been reported. People talk about the use of single genes and multiple genes, and the people uh, use talk about using different chimeric genes, what we have seen using cryon AC and cryon AB to different proteins. And then people talk about the constitutive promoters, tissue specific promoters. In short, the literature talks about the various strategies to delay this resistance development in insects. But the, the, the matter of fact, the point is we have to go for the safer, more safer alternate technologies for managing the insect pests and diseases. And also, you know, the, there, are, there is a lot of concerns about GMOs uh, in the world, even today. Uh, and th so that's why we, we really need a kind of technique, a technology which is more eco-friendly and publicly acceptable technique. And among them, we know RNAi it could be one of the technology that, that could be a kind of non-transformative technology and could be widely accepted by the consumers uh, because of its uh, robust applications. So I will just, uh, the people who already know this uh, technology, they know these the heroes who are the, who got the Nobel Prize, Andrew Fire and Craig Mello, and the mechanism is very simple. Uh, you can even you can introduce a double a dsRNA uh, from the external environment into the cells, and this double standard RNA gets cleaved by the dicers, and then one of the RNA strand is loaded into the risk complex, and then it links to its targeted mRNA uh, by base pairing, and then the mRNA is cleaved and destroyed, and hence no protein can be synthesized or you can say that you can be able to knock down the transcripts levels of your targeted genes. So this is way, this is how we use this technology and the insect with which we are working is the Clarepidary beetles. We are in right in the middle of central Anatolia and central Anatolia is famous for its potato. Like before I talked about that, that in 
in coming years, we have to produce more foods for the population and, and potatoes could be really, really viable option to, to accomplish the task. And Turkey is one of the largest producer of potatoes and it, it contributes 3% to GDP of the country. So according to 2018 data, 1.3 million hectares uh, area was under potato cultivation and 4.5 million tons were harvested. So like other parts of the crop, um, like Pakistan, we also see that we have different challenges of insect pests, weeds and diseases. But among insect pests, we have serious, very serious pests of uh, credo potato beetle. That is not only, that is not only the, the pest of Asia, America, Europe. So it's everywhere almost where the potato is grown. Uh, if you if you see if you can see the larvae and the adults, in this case you can see the adults are the serious defoliator of the crops, not only potato but also other solanaceous crops. The the trick about uh, used by the CPB is it's 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 it's, uh, it's it's tricked to develop resistance against the chemical insecticides. Right now, uh, like I told you before, that almost this insect has got resistance against all kinds of insecticides available in the market, merely because of its uh, new host associations, new climate adaptations, because of its resistance to insecticides, its increased active detoxifications, in, in enhanced excretion, and also the, its la lack of predation. So uh, we are working with this uh, pest uh, and the, the, the technology we tried to use that was uh, DSRNA and uh, RNAi, but in both cases, we tried implanter as well as we tried a non-transformatic technology where we express, where we can express DSRNA in bacteria and can apply to the plants by different uh, options and this is how we can apply dsrna this is not in this this is not a, a transgenic way this is a non-transformative approach you can in, like i also will show you in previous slides you can introduce uh you can produce double standard rna in bacteria or you can produce in vitro and then you can apply in the form of foliate spray irrigation you can also inject into the trunk seed code, drip irrigations, and the, what will be the result? The result will be that once the double standard RNA is taken, taken up by the insects, the RNA machinery will get activated and will result in the production of those small uh, SIRNAs, and those SIRNAs will go and bind the target, and ultimately that would result in the, uh, the, in the knocking down the transcript levels of your target gene. So uh, this is the work uh, one of our students uh, completed his PhD very recently. Uh, like uh, in this case, uh, like I told you that this is a non-transformative approach. And in this kind of approach, the, the selection of target is really important. Uh, because the CPB, because we are working with the CPB and CPB has got uh, resistance against almost, almost every insecticide, we try to focus uh, on the genes, we try to target the genes which are involved in its resistance. And you know, uh, the people who really work on resistance mechanisms, they are well familiar then. Understanding this mechanism is really uh, challenging. I mean, it's, uh, it's if you look at the mechanism, then there are some particular points uh, that, that whenever how this resistance insects can develop resistance, it could result because of the decreased penetrance and the increased metabolic detoxification and increased excretion rates. So what we did, we tried to uh, we tried to target some of the genes. One of them was cuticle proteins. As you know, the the, the cuticle of the insect is the first barrier to the toxins, uh, whether they are the chemical insecticides that they are natu any natural compounds. So we selected one of the genes from cuticle protein. And once the target is in, into the insect body, then we know that there is a, a detoxification mechanism and the P450 enzymes, they, they play a very key role in its detoxification. And the same happens with their natural compounds. And 
while uh, like CPV, this P450 is also involved in other uh, the mechanisms of insects as well. The third gene which we selected was uh, it actually is also a gene family we selected from the glutathione synthase. So these phase two, this is these are the key player of phase two reaction, and they carry out the detoxification after the completion of phase one reaction, and you know it's a key member of the complex glutathione system with an imperative role in the regulation of cell defense to various biotic and abiotic stress. So the, all the genes we selected in this case uh, were really related to the uh, this resistance mechanism of uh, CPB. So the next part is really easy, uh, easy to perform in laboratory and where you can just amplify your gene of interest. And then you can clone here in this particular vector. This is a really interesting vector, which contains two inverted T7 promoters. And the presence of T7 promoter makes you available, uh, makes you, uh, you, can, you can induce double standard RNA expression if you clone your fragment somewhere here during in these multiple cloning sites. And the, this is how, uh, it, that's, that's part, it's comparatively easy. The point uh, here is to understand it, that what, what, what gene you are going to target, that gene must play a very important role in insect reproduction, growth, or its resistance mechanism. Its length is very important, and the region, which region of the gene you are going to target, and which delivery method you are going to adopt. And by this way, we develop uh, different uh, plasmids that have L triple four zero CP P four fifty and GST. And now CP is a cuticle protein P four fifty and cytochrome P four fifty and GST. Uh, now I will show you some of the results which we obtained. Once the uh, one the point I want to make that after you develop your uh, uh, after you clone, uh, after you are able to clone your fragments here, now you have to transfer this plasmid to a particular strain. That strain, uh, this is HD one one five strains. This strain uh, has is uh, uh, very particular in the purpose that uh, it is free of any RNA three enzymes. So it means your the double strand RNA which will be produced by by the injection of IPTG that will be really free of any nuclease activity. So that's a simple, uh, you can produce your uh, DSRNA in bacteria. And then once it's produced, you can conform and you can apply, uh, you can perform your bioassays, you can perform in the form of spray, you can perform, uh, you can apply, uh, you, you can risk kind of, uh, you can, Take the trifoliate of the plant. You can spread the that the lysate of the bacteria, and this is how you can perform your uh, experiments. So in this case, uh, we try to perform, we try to uh, check these three different uh, double standard RNAs against the first, second, third, and fourth instar of the larvae. So if you can, if you can see the mortality data. Of the of the larvae that were the fed on the cuticle proteins after the sixth day were hundred percent. Cuticle protein was really uh, good in our experiments. So followed by its P four fifty and GST and the data of the second star after the sixth day, the six to seven percent mortality data was recorded in in CP a cuticle protein and likewise were followed by P four fifty three, P four fifty three and GST. Uh, so uh, in this, we we came to know that uh, that DSRNA is really uh, handy uh, to control the first and second instar larvae. So in next, so what what, what we saw we tried to uh, use the same uh, the same RNAs against the third instar larvae, but interestingly the the mortality level declined, and still the, it was fifty percent, which is very Kind of acceptable. Uh, it was uh, fifty percent uh, of the of the mortality was recorded in larvae that were feeding on DSRNA 
plants that was uh, that was targeting cuticle protein of the plant, and likewise, uh, thirty one percent and fifteen percent mortality was observed in case of P four fifteen BSD. So the larvae, the, the larval mortality reduced actually uh, in case of P450 and GSD compared to, uh, compared to CP. And the same was observed in our uh, fourth in star assay, where, uh, for, you know, fourth in star la uh, larva of CPB is really a very active larva. Uh, the people working with CPB really knows, and only 12% was uh, mortality was observed in case of uh, larvae feeding on CPDS RNA, while in case of P450 and GST was really less compared to the uh, CP. So from here, uh, we thought that, okay, great, the first and second star larva are really, uh, this, this the application of DS RNA is really handy against the first and second star larva. Let's look at the survival rate and let's look at the other parameters of uh, related to its behavior to and let's see how the effects of these three dsrna uh, continues on their pupation on their larval durations and also the weight gain so if you here you can see that the weight gain uh, in control uh, was uh, is, is in control was significantly higher uh, when uh, compared to the uh, the larvae uh, that were feeding on other dsRNAs, and this, in case of CPB, there was a significantly lower weight gain in case of CPB. That was 18 milligram. So it means uh, it shows that the larvae uh, were able to eat less, uh, to uh, to consume less uh, that were feeding on uh, the dsRNA of CP gene. So uh, again, the same weight gain, similar kind of result was obtained. I will quickly go through these slides. So CP, all the time, CP was really uh, working efficiently. And then uh, if the larval duration, duration, if you look at the larval duration uh, of this second star CPB larvae, after three days feeding on uh, three different kinds of DSRNAs, so you can see that again, CP, uh, lesser time was taken by the second instar larva to reach pupil state after feeding on CP compared to the others. And so, so if you if you uh, and, and the, in case of third instar larvae, the number of days to reach the pupil stage for the third instar larvae uh, with the CP uh, was were 5.5, 5.8, 5 and six days comparatively to the control. So compared to the control, uh, they took less days to go into the pupil stage. And likewise, in uh, fourth instar larva, a, again, the lesser day days that were 3.6 was required by the fourth instar larvae to reach a uh, pupil stage, uh, especially those feeding on the uh, uh, CPDS RNA. So uh, the, the point uh, here is that the, the larval duration of the, diff of the larva different larvas, second, third, and fourth larva was reduced when they fed on the dsRNA. So uh, likewise, we also checked that the effect of these dsRNAs on the pupatial duration. Uh, what was the duration? So if you, you can see from this graph then that the prolonged pupil duration in larvae which were fed on the dsRNA uh, targeted to CP, that was 12.3 days. And the lesser pupation was taken in case of P450 and the control, that was only 10.2. So the, in case of uh, contr the control larvae took more days, uh, took less days uh, to, to, to develop into adult compared to the larvae, uh, compared to the pupil duration, of third instar larva that were feeding on CP. So similar is the case with the uh, pupatial, uh, pupatial uh, pupil, pupil duration recorded in the fourth instar larva after their exposure to dsRNA. For three, they varied between different uh, treatments. The pupil duration recorded in CP treatments was more 11.2 days, while the pupil duration in the control was normal 
on one day. So uh, likewise, uh, the, because the hypothesis was uh, whether uh, whether the larvae is feeding on these plants treated with different double standard RNAs. Uh, what is the effect of these small RNAs uh, at the molecular level? So what we did, we tried to understand uh, the different transcripts level of these genes by qPCR. So, you know, the larvae were subjected to uh, this qPCR and we found the reduced transcripts levels of these uh, of the insect pests feeding on CP, GSS, and P450. And likewise, in the second instar larvae, again, the reduced level of all these three genes were found in these insect uh, pests. If, but interestingly, in, interestingly, an experiment that we, that we conducted on the third and fourth instar larvae, we also find the reduced transcript levels of, of CP, GSS, and P450 uh, enzymes. Uh, by qPCR assays, so establishing uh, the hypothesis that uh, that, uh, that that the dsRNA is being uh, being activated with an insect machinery into small siRNAs, and that is going and targeting uh, different genes like CP, GSNs, and P450, and among all uh, the other entomological keeping in with other entomological parameters. And QPCR, CP performed uh, really good. So we thought that, okay, DSRN is doing good uh, in case of just its application. Why not to uh, perform a synergist experiment? What we try to do, we try to reduce the DSRN concentration to half, and also we try to reduce uh, the concentration of chemical insecticide, amidochlorpid, to half. So 50 50. Uh, of the insecticidal concentration and the DSRNA concentration was re reduced. And then the bioassays were conducted with second instar larval assay. And interestingly, because of this synergistic effect, uh, we found 100% mortality, mortality of uh, CPB larvae of second, second instar, uh, followed by 97% in GSS, uh, G GST. So the point is, uh, yes, the synergism uh, did really trick the combination of chemical insecticide with very with fifty percent reduced amount and DSRNA that is also reduced amount resulted in hundred percent mortality of insect pest uh, second instar larva. So what we concluded that the lethal and sublethal effects of three different RNAs on various life stages of CBB showed that. These are any significant, significantly affected survival, duration, and weight gain in treated insects. Synergism experiments showed the remarkable potential of three different RNA as synergistic with amidochlorpid. And so this is this this was the work which we uh, which we performed with the, in case of uh, bacterially expressed DSRNA. So. So we are also using a method of implant RNAi where, where we are trying to induce our transgene containing sense and antisense fragment of our gene of interest into spread by the intron. And we're trying to introduce into the plants and uh, tomato, we are working with tomato. And once the transgenic plants are produced, uh, we allow the plants to feed on the transgenic plants. And when the insects feed on the transgenic plants, the RNA machinery in insect cells gets activated. And the same process of RNA, which I described earlier, gets activated. And as a result, our, the transcripts levels of our target genes gets reduced. So in this case, we have uh, we have used a ECR gene. This gene is related to the molting of insects. What we are trying to do, we are trying to reduce the molting. Of the, we are trying to inhibit the molting of the insects. Uh, and what we have seen as a result of our assays, we have seen that the insects from the first instars was not, was not able to shift into second instar properly, and retarded growth of the larvae was observed from the second instar to third instar. In short, 
the molting of the plant was uh, was inhibited, was halted, and this was a result of the ECR gene that is very actively involved in insect metamorphosis. So uh, the, the the fragment, the particular fragment of ECR, was cloned in sense and antisense fragment, and transgenic plants of tomatoes were produced with a single insertion, which you can see here. The the transformation of potato is relatively easy compared to some other recalcitrant crops. And interestingly, in some of the lines, we got 80% mortality, while in some of the lines, uh, we got 60% mortality of third in star larvae, which is really promising. So both in, both work, uh, like I said, were funded by uh, Tubatak, which, which is the main uh, national funding agency, and the other work of uh, DSRNA of uh, Sprayable that was funded by the Doge Research and Development. It's a private firm. You know, the research work is actually integration of uh, the researcher from different fields. Professor Ayan Gokche, he's, uh, he's a pure entomologist. He's always active. He was a part of this. He is actually a part of this group. And Professor Mehmet Minchachkan is a potato breeder. So he's helping us in the breeding aspects. And Professor Dr. Emre, he's, he's looking after the bioinformatic part of this project, of these projects. So right now we are in the patenting the process of our recombinant plasmids, which we developed. And then we are also going to uh, develop this DSRNA technology on a large scale and what we are trying to plan we're trying to test them in the field conditions very soon after the proper permission from Ministry of Agriculture with this I would like to thank everyone for being here I, I'm open to any questions suggestions uh, I will also be present on the day of uh, at the conference for any question I will be happy to take questions from you so thank you so much and with that I would like to say goodbye.